So, is everyone ready to get started? All right, so I'm gonna um, do a brief introduction and then I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, Nadia? No doubt. Um, so, good evening and thank you for joining us tonight uh, for Civic Allyship's first workshop in a series of six. Briefly, let me tell you who we are. Um, Civic Allyship is the Dwight Hall Initiative. Dwight Hall is a student community engagement home at Yale. Dwight Hall at Yale is the 501c3 not-for-profit organization that was founded by undergrads in 1886 and has operated continuously since then as a student-led entity. So I'm gonna stop there on Dwight Hall breakdown. Dwight Hall, you can find information on the website. I'm gonna give you how I see Dwight Hall. It is um, a bridge between New Haven and Yale. And uh, it is a bridge that desires to grow horizontally. So that way there's more access. Um, be, uh, with that, I'm James Jetter. Um, civic allyship comes out of the White Hall. It comes from uh, access. Uh, as a New Haven native, I was given access to the White Hall through Zelda Rowling, um, who found a way to get me to help her uh, establish Yale Prison Education Initiative um, at the White Hall. Um, that opened up so many doors for me, allowing me to uh, bring issues that I was passionate about um, very close uh, to the campus. Um, and the campus that was a childhood campus of mine as a, as a UCS grant uh, participant. Um, and out of, out of bringing these issues to the campus and working with YPI, uh, I was able to establish some relationships uh, within the Whitehall and across the campus and in conversations with students um, around uh, voting rights issues, uh, uh, specifically uh, uh, felony pro uh, disenfranchisement in Connecticut. A statement was made to me and the person said, um, people in New Haven don't want us voting in their elections. And I said, that's not true. They don't want you telling them who to vote for. And you no, know, that sparked a series of discussions about what it means to be here, to be in a city uh, so small, but yet has every issue, every large city, and to be a part of this international conglomerate um, the institution and this relationship that it has with this city. Um, and you know, they were interested. And I think that was, that was huge because uh, as a Yale student, you are being groomed to be future leaders. And um, the, what you can gain from this community and what this community can gain um, from the, the bloodline, the heart of the institution, which is you, um, can be a win for everybody. And, and um, so we're, this is the first attempt in, you know, trying to find this particular way to, uh, to, to bridge that gap. And um, with that, um, I want to present to you Nauru, who I know uh, as Nadir Abdul Salam, um, a childhood uh, friend of mine, um, who um, has had an amazing journey and is going to take you on what he has come to uh, become a, a, a renowned source for, and that's uh, his historical knowledge on uh, New Haven in, in, in Yale and, and this relationship in, in one of our country's first playing cities. Um, from there, I'm, from here, I'm gonna let him take over. I wanna say one thing about what, what we're doing with Civic Allyship. Um, we are running six, six workshops, which are completely up to the, 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 the workshop organizer. Um, so they have, we, are, we are trying to bridge this gap in a way where people who might not have access or you might not have known, but have done tremendous things in, in, in our New Haven natives or have committed themselves to some part of the city um, in, in, in a way that we think is unique. Um, and we're giving them a platform uh, to, to, to display what, they, what, what, they're, what they're doing, what they're working on. Um, so Nadir has a lecture for us and um, I'm gonna let him take it over here to break down what's gonna happen. All right, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, thank you, J um, James, for the introduction. Uh, thank you everybody that's attending this lecture um, for this opportunity. Uh, definitely we'd like to just you know, create an exchange of, in a dialogue uh, based off some serious issues that have faced us in history and still affects us to this day. So, um, it's a lot of information and we're kind of pressed for time. So I'm um, gonna we'll just get right into everything, but definitely um, 
uh, ask any, any questions that you have, just put it inside the board and um, we'll try to get to them uh, at the end of the lecture. So um, basically I have a podcast that uh, deals with the systemic oppression and the trauma um, that the black community has faced uh, living in the New Haven area for the past 400 years. So um, New Haven is a perfect place for a case study because of the level of information that has been preserved over the years. So in this lecture, we will explore the history um, of the marginalization and oppression of the black community in New Haven. And we will focus on the first 200 years of the colony and also explores the present conditions of the black community in New Haven. So um, I wanna start with a little bit of New Haven history so we can have a better understanding of the social and political climate in regards to the black community in New Haven during the conception of Yale University. Um, and like I said, um, I welcome all questions and look forward to the discussion at the conclusion of this lecture. All right, so um, the first part is titled The History of Torture, Human Trafficking, and Hostages in the New Haven Colony. So in this lecture, we will discuss the history of human trafficking and torture in the New Haven Colony. We will also discuss the transition from being African hostages to citizens under systemic oppression. So first let's discuss uh, hostages, crimes, and the New Haven Colony. Connecticut was a key site for studying human trafficking in New England, both because of its particular mix of urban centers, small ports, and the frontier farms, and because the evidence it provides from about the different conflicts that it had with the Native Americans, the foreign accounts of human trafficking, and also the different changes in the legal statuses that um, were monumental within, this, um, within the state alone. So human trafficking and holding hostages was not a poor man's enterprise. It was during the founding of New Haven, the main ones holding African hostages were ministers, doctors, and the merchant elite. Now hostages in the North often perform household duties in addition to skilled jobs. They worked as carpenters, shipwrecks, sail makers, printers, tailors, shoemakers, coopers, blacksmiths, bakers, weavers, and goldsmiths. And many became so talented in their crafts that the free white workers lost their job to them. So the, the first governors of New Haven um, was Theophilus Eaton, who was a known human trafficker. And he came to the colony with three hostages, John and Lucretia Cram, and another name was Nigger Anthony. Um, he also came with uh, John Davenport, who was a Puritan reverend, and uh, Edward Hopkins, uh, who also were both um, known for being human traffickers and own hostages. Uh, the human trafficking in New England at the time, um, it was a Puritan society. So the African hostages of colonial Connecticut did have a place within that social order. They were expected to follow the Christian principles by which the human traffickers live. They were forced to attend the same congressional churches and sit in their own sections and worship with the families that held them hostage. Historians like to describe human trafficking as paternalistic in Connecticut with hostages treated as irresponsible junior family members on some occasions and nearly as equals on others, but that is more of a romanticized version of a heinous crime. So the Connecticut Black Codes. Um, uh, discrimination against free blacks uh, was more severe in Connecticut than in other New England colonies. Their lives were strongly criminalized even before they became numerous. In 1690, the colony forbade blacks and Indians to be on the street after 9 p.m. It also forbid black hostages from wandering beyond the limits of the town or places where they belong without a ticket or pass from the human traffickers or the authorities. And some of these practices, um, even though they're not in law, they're cultural practices. So um, certain town lines that you come outside the city limits of New Haven um, are heavily policed and they um, often just pull over random cars and profile different black drivers to see whether they're um, have their registration or insurance or if they have drugs or if they're found in the car. And um, also there was a law in 1708 citing frequent fights between uh, hostages and um, white citizens. So they imposed a minimum penalty of 30 lashes of any African hostage or freeman who disturbed the peace or who attempted to strike a white person. And they seen it as a serious crime for African hostage or freeman to strike or to presume to strike a white person. But a white man was simply exercising his right as a member of a superior caste in abusing the African hostage or freeman. 
and they can strike him with impunity. But there were some laws that prohibited, prohibited maiming and killing, and a hostage is able to take the human traffickers to court for abuse. And some have been successful in their cases in the New Haven area. So in 1717, the General Assembly prohibited throughout the colony free blacks, even retroactively, from owning land or going into business without permission of the local politicians. A further and most important historical factor is that the credibility of the witness and by law in most Southern states and some Northern states an African hostage or freeman could not testify against a white man, even for himself. And no African hostage or freeman was permitted to serve on a jury. So that was not only in the Southern states, as I said, it was also practiced in the North. Um, another historical factor relates to the crimes for which African hostages may be arrested. And historically, um, they said that protesting any white man by African hostage or freeman was disrespectful or seen as disorderly conduct. And by 1730, there was a law that any black uh, Native American or mulatto hostage or freeman who spoke or wrote about any white person, words that could be actionable if uttered by a free white man upon conviction was to be tortured and whipped with 40 lashes. So it cannot be doubted that these historical factors have a very decided influence in the cases of black people in our criminal punishment system um, that we have today in America. Crime and torture in New Haven has been unequal since the founding of the colony. So let's look at the, the first person that was um, executed in New Haven. It was uh, George Spencer, and he was the first non-Native American that was executed in New Haven, and he was executed for breaking a Puritan law of bestiality. And uh, the story is that George, um, was um, a real intimidating looking person. He had one bad eye, which was possibly a cataract or maybe damage from abuse. And it was like a milky white look. So it, it gave off a very scary appearance to the people in the town. And uh, after a piglet was born with one eye and um, it was in the form of a former employee of George Spencer, they um, accused him of bestiality. And in the, as a biblical crime, it was punishable by death. So George, he vehemently denied the charges, but uh, he saw that it was going to torture him anyway. So he told them and to confess that so he could be spared. So he said that what, exactly what the, um, the prosecutors wanted to hear, even though his story was full of inconsistencies. And similar to a lot of police tactics that are utilized today, uh, they use his words against him and convicted him of bestiality and sentenced him to death. So rape was also used as a way to criminalize black men and demonize them in society. Rape was no longer seen as a capital punishment when involving a white perpetrator. And in New Haven, the only people executed for rape were black men whose guilt was questionable. And there were only two. The first one was Nico Cuffey. And his story is that he was a hostage of a malicious, a malicious soldier that was passing through Connecticut um, he was charged for raping a 15-year-old girl in the East Haven, New Haven area while walking down the street. He denied the crime and pled not guilty. His attorneys argued about the veracity of the witnesses' statements, but as we said, you can, um, the, witness thing, the, the witnesses that were African hostages didn't hold no weight in the court of law. So an all-male jury sentenced him to death by hanging, and that was in 1749. And the next one, um, which was a little bit more well-known, was the story of Joseph Mountain. Um, who was um, who was a born African hostage in Philadelphia around 1758, and while attending a Quaker school, um, he did not like the way his future looked in America. So he heard about the Somerset decision by Britain, and it outlawed slavery in Britain in the British colonies. So he joined a, a boat crew and sailed first to London, where he got involved with a street robbery crew. Um, he would do con jobs, stick ups, and uh, rob different aristocrats. And in his time in London, he would, um, had the opportunity to marry a young white woman of, of means, that's with, um, according to the story. Uh, the integrated society brought joy to Joseph at the time because all the poor Londoners were on a level playing field. If there was work to be worked, um, people went to work, but when there wasn't work available, people committed crimes, but that was just part of the culture. And while in Britain, Joseph Mountain participated in the Gordon Riots of 1780, uh, he was a part of a surging interracial crowd that destroyed elite property and liberated prisons until the military suppressed them. 
he traveled the world. Uh, he saw, went to, throughout Europe, the West Coast of Africa, back to America. And um, he always came back to London for the first um, 10 to 15 years. But um, by 1790, he decided to return back to America. And he docked in Boston and traveled to New York City. So while he was traveling from New York City, uh, he stepped in Hartford and um, he robbed a, a riverboat for about five dollars. He was caught and um, sentenced to torture, and he was beat with um, a few lashes. And they set him on his way. That gave him, you know, made him really upset. So by the time he got to New Haven, he went and got um, got intoxicated. And on his walk from New Haven to New York, he ran into um, two young women. And the story says that um, he accosted them and they didn't want to talk to him or something like that. And that he physically grabbed one and that caused um, a commotion. And then when that happened, a lot of the neighbors came up and they held him until the authorities came. Um, he pled not guilty to um, the charge of rape. But um, it was 11 witnesses, including the teenage sisters, that testified against him. They said that he allegedly lingered at the scene, yelling abuses at the rescuers. And when he was apprehended, they just locked him up and basically threw away the key. He was prosecuted at that time by David Daggett. And a jury in the New Haven Superior Court immediately found Joseph Martin um, guilty of rape on um, May 26, 1790. And he was later executed in a public hanging. So what makes this um, case so spectacular is that um, in public media and you know, popular literature, black criminals were typified as rapists with the capacity to commit um, all that was evil. And one of the earliest propaganda books promoting this negative stereotype was a book written by David Daggett. Um, in New Haven, there's a street named after him or his family. But um, he wrote a fake confessional of Joseph Martin sensationalizing it to create the negative stereotype that justified his killing, even though he was innocent of committing a capital offense. Uh, he, his story painted the image of the black man as an oversexed brute with the proclivity of crime and criminal behavior. This book will be circulated at his public execution. And since an ad um, for the hanging was printed in papers as far as Boston and Philadelphia, people traveled to attend the execution and brought back the book as a souvenir. Uh, Daggett was invested along with other leading figures of New Haven in prominently illustrating Mountain's singular atrocity and to use that to justify his execution. The newly emerging and popular genre of sensational crime literature, it became the most popular criminal confession story of that era, being printed in different regions and in different languages. David Daggett, after treating the Joseph Mountain case like the Central Park Five, um, founded the Yale Law School, and he was also served as a, a term as a mayor of New Haven. And by 1830, rape was no longer considered a capital punishment in Connecticut. And from the beginning of the colony to 1830, court sentenced 11 men to hang for the crime. And seven were black and four were white, but through appeals, um, only six men were hanged, and that was five blacks and only one white. And throughout the entire period, the African-American population was minimal, yet more than 80% of those executed for rape were of African descent. And this is um, one of the origins of where the myth of the black rapists became a legend. And as we see through our history, like um, Rosewood and cases like Emmett Till, that, um, that myth was perpetuated to cause more violence on the black community. Some writers of the period suggested that Blacks, uh, quote unquote, had evil propensities and were rooted in inherent desire and innate defiance. Others claimed that the Black crime stemmed from environmental factors. This is still an ongoing debate, even though the latter is a more accurate explanation. Importing hostages became illegal prior to the Revolutionary War. The purpose of the abolition, abolition of human trafficking was built, um, more of a political thing because Connecticut wanted to deprive England of a source of profit and it was thus a blow for their own freedom. Connecticut merchants were not heavily involved in the human trafficking tra trade like some in Boston and Newport and the state could afford to end it. But any humanitarian impulses to being human trafficking was just secondary. 
it was mainly to show protest against English rule. The practice still continued domestically. So the Revolutionary War um, was something that was um, a positive thing for the black community because service in the army was often a way for blacks to achieve their freedom. British in a bid to weaken American um, forces or for African hostages freedom if they fought for them. Many African hostages escaped the human traffickers and picked up arms for the British army. Some um, African hostages were freed by patriotic masters to serve, and some hostages served in place of their mm, human traffickers with freedom as the reward at the end of their enlistment. Some hostages used their enlistment bounty to buy their own freedom, and some African hostages served with no promise of freedom at all, but accompanied their masters out of loyalty for the end, looking for adventure. And adventure and bounty um, also moved many free blacks as well as many whites to serve. So the Revolutionary War brought about a, a huge transfer of wealth in the country, and many black freemen and hostages were unable to fully participate in that transfer. So, but when they came back um, from the war, they wanted not freedom just for themselves, but for the rest of their family. And they um, petitioned the Connecticut legislator um, for the Gradual Manumission Act, which freed all the children of slaves born after 1784, after they turned 25. Later, it was changed to 21. So emancipated black men and women um, and men and women who escaped enslavement made up the, um, the bulk of the community of free black people in New Haven. They still had to be subjected to those same black codes. And freed and enslaved blacks commingled in the city because all the accommodations were segregated. And at that time, black neighborhoods were created during the colonial period, but they became established really during the federal era and were moved at the whim of the government. So the early black neighborhoods were found um, at Poverty Square, which is Whaley, Spirit, and Golf, which is in the Dixville neighborhood, Negro Lane, which is um, State Street East, and that was close to um, basically by the first bridge coming down State Street going, um, going towards East Rock, and New Guinea, which is in Wooster Square, and also um, known as New Liberia. By the early 1800s, a majority of the black population in Connecticut were no longer hostages, but were still subjected to the black codes imposed on black hostages that were still held captive. The black populations in the city began to rise, so the General Assembly created a clause to disenfranchise free blacks by specifying that only free white men had the right to vote. So even after declaring war and sacrificing life over being taxed without representation, the white population felt the need to subject the black inhabitants to the such unequal treatment that they were willing to die for. So black um, New Haven businessmen like William Linson and Bias Stanley, they petitioned against the ruling. Paying taxes on their businesses and properties, they felt that they should not be disenfranchised, but the state felt otherwise and denied their request. So free Africans were more likely to be imprisoned than African hostages and at that time, one third of Newgate prison population was black, um, even though black people were 128th of the state population at the time. So that concludes the first part of the lecture. So the next part, we're going to go into um, a titled Birth of a Nation, the Founding of Yale University and its Reliance on Human Trafficking and African Hostages. So in this section of the lecture, we will explore the founding of Yale University, human trafficking, and the birth of America. Yale University is a very powerful academic institution, and even that is an understatement. There are very few institutions that were produced as many and that produce as many leaders of industry, politics, and science with power and influence. If they are able to amass this much power globally, just imagine the amount of power that they hold locally at their base. So the relationship between New Haven and Yale, referred infamously as town and gown, started from its inception. One of the founders, John Davenport, a Puritan clergyman and human trafficker, wanted to create a college to educate ministers for the people in the new colonies that would later become America. Davenport went to Edward Hawkins, um, who was also a human trafficker and relative to Theophilus Eaton and the governor of Connecticut at the, the Connecticut colony, 
who saw his vision and made a sizable donation towards the education of residents in the New Haven Colony. Around this time, a death warrant was signed uh, for King Charles in England. And then when the restoration of the monarchy came, the signers became fugitives. And three of those regicides came to New Haven looking for safety. And John Davenport assisted the regicides because he was against the Anglican Church. And this, in my opinion, were the precursors to the American independence movement. After uh, Edward Hopkins died, he left the estate to Davenport, who wanted to see his vision play out. The grammar school did not go well in New Haven because the families were not as interested. He was able to open up a college preparatory school, but that too did not have as much success as he wanted. And Davenport felt that Jesus Christ himself lost interest in New Haven and that it was miserably lost. Um, Hopkins College Preparatory School was still open to this day, but when Hopkins died, the money from him went to Harvard instead. But the dream for the Connecticut College did not die with Davenport. 30 years from his death, a young Harvard graduate named James Pierpont came to New Haven. Uh, he entered into John Davenport's pastoral collective and married his widowed daughter in law. And he took up Davenport's mission by buying his land and also the books that was left as endowments for the Connecticut College. Pierpont also and many of his fellow Harvard graduates came to New Haven to help proceed um, in pushing Davenport's vision. They all consolidated power with local clergy and as founders, they created the Charter for Connecticut for the purpose of teaching the youth to be fitted for public employment, both in church and civil state which goes back to my um, opening statement about how powerful and far reaching the Yale alumnus are, because this decision was made at the house of Abraham Pearson where the original trustees of Yale gathered along with their hostages as servants. Um, the founders needed assistance in putting the college together. So they wrote a letter to the Mathers brothers, Increase and Cotton. Cotton was uh, the president of Harvard before he was ousted and the founders of the Connecticut College needed help setting up a Bible college, and Mathers um, obliged to assist them. The college continued to struggle until another Harvard alumni stepped in to save the struggling collegiate school, and that was Jeremiah Doomer. Um, he was a Harvard grad who left for England after graduation. Um, and he is considered in history as the first American because he championed the independence of the Massachusetts colony and later the Connecticut colony while he was in Europe. Uh, Doomer assisted uh, Pierpont by delivering a large parcel of books ranging from topics of British royal papers, religion, poetry, and science. He also sent a parcel of books from a governor of Madras, India, Elihu Yale, who is um, of relation to the merchant founder of New Haven Theophilus Eaton. So Yale was also a human trafficker, like his relative, and in India, he was known as a notorious human trafficker who took advantage of the drought of the, in the Madras region. And he bought 300 slaves and shipped them to British colonies um, throughout the Atlantic. And this is how you find a lot of Indian culture in the Caribbean. And I find that interesting how Elihu Yell played a part in bringing that to be. And he also um, imposed a law that every ship bound for the British colonies must have at least 10 hostages on it. And he is responsible for also shipping Indian hostages across the Indian Ocean to places like Sumatra and Madagascar. He was known to hang Indian citizens and silence his opposition with death. And he can be seen in his paintings at the Yale Art Gallery with the small Tamil boy being held hostage with a little chain around his neck, like a, or a collar around his neck, like an animal. So in the Yale revisionist history, uh, Doomer does not exist, and the narratives that Mathers wrote to Elihu Yale for assistance and told him if um, he gives a sizable donation that his name will be memorialized. So Elihu Yale took the profits he made from human trafficking and opiate distribution and gave less than what his wealth permitted, but the timing of the gift allowed the founders to use his name as the founder instead of Jeremiah Doomer. So neither have set foot on American soil since the conception of the idea, and both died without seeing their vision come to fruition. So when Yale College opened its doors, it only had a rector and a tutor. The first rector of Yale College was a human trafficker and hostage holder 
and also a Harvard alumni, Alicia Williams. And the first tutor was Jonathan Edwards, a human trafficker and the future president of New Jersey College, which was later named Princeton. Now, the college has its name, it has its books, and it has land. Now they needed funding for the library and students. So the first scholarship fund was created by Bishop George Berkeley, whom Berkeley College on the Yale's campus is named after. He was a human trafficker who owned a plantation in Rhode Island, and when he left the American colonies, he left the plantation to Yale College, who in turn rented it out to Charles Handy, who used African hostages to work the plantation to provide money to Yale. According to records, Berkeley purchased two hostages and baptized three hostages at a ceremony. And the census records show that Charles Handy owned four slaves or four hostages, which may have included the ones that Berkeley purchased. Berkeley um, shared a popular sentiment when discussing Christianity and human trafficking that I have to quote him directly. He stated, it would be of advantage to their slave master's affairs to have slaves who should obey in all things their masters according to the fed, to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart as fearing God that gospel liberty consists with temporal servitude and their slaves would only become better slaves by being Christian. So next, uh, they needed books. Reverend Jared Elliott, one of the original students of Yale College and successors to Pierpont's pulpit, was a human trafficker who um, held two African hostages. When he died, he left the money he made off the labor of his hostages to a library fund, which eventually became a part of the Sterling Library. First uh, endowment and professorship was given by Philip Livingston, who at the time was considered one of New York's biggest human traffickers. He inherited hostages from his father and his in-laws and continued the family business. He donated silver that was used to fund the first professorship and to this day, the professorship seat is named after him. And every aspect of Yale's growth was funded by human trafficking and the labor of African hostages. The Yale founders and contributors used intellectual arguments to justify these evil deeds. Yale College was effective in creating clergy but it was future Yale president Ezra Stiles that had the vision of creating Yale University. Ezra Stiles, also a clergyman, then also practiced human trafficking. Um, he would send royal goods to Africa in exchange for African hostages. He was known for ordering specific, um, specific hostages, um, and there's a record of him ordering a Negro 12 to 15 years old, straight limb with a docile temperament. Uh, this man, well, this uh, person um, that he named Newport uh, after the city that he bought him in. He held him hostage until the age of 30. And when Ezra Stiles was hired to be the president at Yale College, um, as we spoke about in the earlier episodes, life for free to African in New England was pretty hard. So, uh, especially in the late 1700s. So when Newport ended up being... Um, homeless basically so he traveled to new haven and became ezra styles indentured servant and he gave his wife and his son to be servants also so his son had to be his servant until he turned to age of 24 which was part of the gradual manumission clause and at the time his son was only three years old so ezra styles promoted the noah stories and talmudic teachings of the curse of ham which says that people of the dark race are destined to serve the children of Shem and Japhet. Ezra Stiles considered the Puritans as the sons of Japhet, and that is how he justified the institution of slavery. New Haven and Yale were both established well before the United States of America, and many of his founders and early alumni molded the America to what it is, to te um, what it is today. There were 14 Yale alumni present at the Continental Congress and four alumni that signed the Declaration of Independence. One of them was a the human trafficker, Jonathan Edwards. Yale's contribution to America, like I said, cannot be overstated. They um, also relied on human trafficking in the labor of hostages and used the power, influence, and intellect to perpetuate this institution. And by the end of the 1700s, uh, plantations were declining and then the hostages of a Yale alumni and New Haven resident, Black Sam, changed the world 
with his invention of the cotton gin. All right, so that was the conclusion of the second part of the lecture. And now we're going to go into the third part, which is titled The Demonizing of Black Intellectuals, um, Education in New Haven's Black Community in the Early 1800s. So Black Education in the New Haven Colony, um, we will discuss how the edu educating of African hostages and freemen in New Haven Colony and the historical challenges in the adversaries to having an educated black population. The black mind at the beginning of the 1800s was becoming more focused on self-determination due to the newly found freedom of African hostages since the end of the Revolutionary War and the Somerset Act. So with the influx of different freemen coming from the West Indians and uh, from the South coming to New Haven, there was a lot of different discussions about what it is to be free. So in 1790, um, let's put it to historical context, uh, a New Haven residence was um, were being held hostage, one that was being held hostage by the Yale graduate Eli Whitney, his name was Black Sam. And he created an invention based off a tool his father made to make it easier to separate the cotton from the rest of the debris. Eli Whitney saw the efficiency in this invention and he was able to mechanize it so that it could be mass produced. And this invention changed America, the cotton gin. The colonies um, at that time, before the cotton gin, uh, and after the, after the revolution, um, before the Revolutionary War, only had about 250,000 African hostages. But by the beginning of the Civil War, um, it exploded to almost 4 million African hostages that were um, living in America. So, also, at that time, around 1790, uh, France and her colonies were going through a cultural revolution. The French uh, Revolution started in the streets of France in 1789, and um, it rippled into the Caribbean, in these colonies in the Caribbean. And this caused a division between the Loyalists and the planters on Haiti, uh, who eventually teamed up with the mulattoes to expel the Loyalists off the island. So the free Africans and the hostages uh, learned that the white slaves in France were killing their masters in the streets of France. And now was their turn to seize power. Utilizing African spiritual traditions, the African population took up the first successful slave rebellion that took place in the Western Hemisphere, spearheaded by sovereign Maroons encampments and escaped hostages. They were able to create networks that expanded across the entire island into the cities and towns and the Haitian Revolution um, it lasted for over a decade. And they were able to defeat Napoleon's army and gain independence. The symbolism was powerful, even though it was noble, it, um, it was also a period victory. So these two events at the beginning of the century set the tone and direction for the next century. And the more knowledge African hostages and freemen obtained, the more likely they would demand their freedom and New Haven was not immune to this. The black governorship allowed them a level of sovereignty by proxy, even though they were still under white oppression, the black governorship and segregation gave them a sense of autonomy, as opposed to the South whose African hostage population exploded and the planters brutally oppressed them and they were bound by an honor code of violence that they had to adapt in order to survive. <clears throat> Let me get a drink of water. All right, so New Haven being home to Yale University had a long history of offering educational opportunities to its white residents. John Davenport had plans of creating a grammar school for the families in the city. And as early as 1650, New Haven had established a public school for its white residents. It didn't become successful until the state sold its Western territory and created a public school fund. African hostages and freedmen were not considered for instructions. And after the Revolutionary War and the Gradual Manumission Act, the black population had to become educated because they were no longer bonded to a human trafficker. This brought the demand for educational opportunities for the free black men and women in New Haven. Um, the first school um, for African Americans was established in 1811. And one of the instructors of the school was Jacob Olson. 
and little is known about his early life, but what is known is that he is of West Indian descent and he came to New Haven around 1805. As an instructor at the school, Jacob Olsen was known as a knowledgeable but strict educator. Jacob Olsen was a contemporary of William Lanson and also of Leonard Bacon. And during the time when the city's black population started to gain more runaway hostages from the South, Lanson and Olsen provided opportunities for them to integrate into New Haven society. Many of the white intellectuals in the city felt the solution to the influx of freed African hostages would be not to allow them into the greater society, instead train them to be Christians and send them to an African colony so they can spread Christianity to Africans and not be a burden of the American society. So they had their motives for educating the black population. Okay, so emancipated black intellectuals at that time were having an identity crisis. After becoming literate, questions as to what it was to be a black person living in America became a topic of intellectual discussions and discourse. At a time when race started to become a social construct in the end of the 17th and beginning of the 18th century. As early as 1780, um, black founders began to create intellectual dialogue as race is um, a dialogue on race as opposed to the dominant white culture's negative perspective on blackness. Um, they had to have their own um, autonomy on their thoughts of what it is to be black and what it is to be free. Many uh, started to look to Africa for their identity. Some even strived to make communities in Africa based on commerce and religious service. Jacob Olsen, he solidified his place within history with his writings on this topic. In 1820, Olsen published his famous writings titled, A Search for Truth. And in this writings, Olsen explored the origins of the black race from a biblical lens, as well as a historical lens. And through biblical texts, he used the, t the stories to show that humanity has a common origin as opposed to Ezra Stiles, who used the biblical stories to dehumanize. Jacob's historical view on African history was also revolutionary. He showed the historical fact that Africa was the cradle of Western civilization. Even in that era, he saw that Egypt was um, an African country that was responsible for Greek enlightenment, enlightenment. And he also highlighted that Black Nubia as the seat of education in the ancient Africa um, that basically uh, rose, that Egypt rose from. And the many African bishops that led the early Christian church um, were black people from Africa. And that was just a, a fact that was known, but not taught. So he also took up issue with the name Negro and arguing that it did not connect us to our ancestral home, thus coining the term African-American. And this statement sums up um, his beliefs in what the book that he stated wrote. Um, Had the Christian nations been as ambitious to train up our minds to religion and piety as they were to enslave and live upon the ill-gotten wealth by injustice and cruelty, our minds would have never been as degraded as they are represented to be. So he likened the African community to a caged lion. And he stated, let his majesty the lion be unbound and he will resume his former prerogative. So let us be emancipated from our encumbrances and then where our ignorance and darkness reigns, religion and true science would be abound. Jacob Olson would make this speech to the citizens of New Haven, whose black community was rapidly growing and enterprising free black men like William Lanson, Bias Stanley, Scipio Augustus, and Prince Duplex took these words to heart. So Jacob Olson also addressed one of the founders and bishops of the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, Christopher Rush. Um, he was one of the largest, well, he was leader of one of the largest black church organizations in the country. And this New Haven educator's impact on the African American history, like I said, um, cannot be overstated. And it had an immense impact on the debate about slavery and colonization. So, as I spoke of earlier, um, the black intellectuals saw repatriation to Africa as a possible future for Africans in America. And as early as 1773, with the creation of the British colony Sierra Leone, free blacks started to repatriate back to Africa. 
After Haiti gained independence, more free Africans in America saw repatriation as a means of becoming autonomous. In Boston, a black man named Paul Cuffey ventured to Africa multiple times with other Africans in, from America to see the prospects of Sierra Leone. Paul asked for support from both the British and the United States government, but died shortly after his last, visit, um, last voyage in 1817. So there was a faction of white abolitionists that created the American Colonization Society. Their motive for colonization was their willingness to not live up to the Declaration of Independence, stating that all men are created equal. They didn't like the institution of slavery, but they held sharing power and resources with former hostages with the same disdain. Integration was not an option they wanted to entertain. So the white clergy seen colonization as a way to spread Western ideas and Christianity in Africa and using the former hostages as their proxies. And as a response to the slave revolts, Congress, um, after hearing about Paul Cuffey, they floated sending the black population to either West African coast or to territories in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and from this congressional debate, the American Colonization Society was born, um, born and it was led by the politician Henry Clay. But before Cuffey passed away, he made it known that the American Colonization Society was not positive by chairing public meetings to denounce the organization. Uh, New Haven's white intellectual elite embraced the American Colonization Society. Many prominent Yale figures embraced this movement and became instrumental to the movement. So Jehudi Ashman, who has a street named after him and is currently uh, buried in the Grove Street Cemetery. He was an earlier supporter of the movement. He published the first newsletter and helped find uh, the colony Liberia in 1922. There he was a leader in setting up the colony. They acquired the land by using um, strong arm tactics and savage tactics uh, similar to how they gained land inside um, the early American colony. Um, his predecessor, Lieutenant Robert Stockton, who in 1821 persuaded the African King Zola Duma, or King Peter, to sell Cape Monserrato um, by pointing a pistol at his head. Ashman um, was prepared to use the same force to extend the colony's territory. Um, he acquired land along the rivers and the ocean fronts, and in his treaty in uh, 1825 with Zola Duma and other native kings, he agreed to sell land in return for 500 bars of tobacco, three barrels of rum, five casts of powder, five umbrellas, 10 iron pots, and 10 pairs of shoes, um, among other items. And he knew that the African Americans needed to be educated in Western ethics in order for them to extend the American empire into Africa and to bring his vision of the colony into fruition. Executing the authority to, or, um, by executing the authoritarian rules of the American Colonization Society, um, he made many enemies with the settlers and the natives of Africa, and he had to eventually retreat to Cape Verde before he moved back to New Haven, where he passed away. So um, simultaneously in New Haven, uh, Yale alumni uh, Leonard Bacon, who was the pastor of New Haven Center Church, took up the task of educating the um, prospective migrants so they can be proxies of the American white power structure in Africa. He felt that in order for the colony to be successful, there needs to be trained clergymen and government agents. Leonard Bacon knew that in order for the American Colonization Society to be accepted, there needed to be three agreements by, first, it needs to be the, um, the black population needs to be on board. Second, they needed the American government so they can get funding. And third, they needed the blessings basically from the Southern planters and aristocrats so they can um, basically funnel out those free slaves coming from the South and send them overseas as soon as possible. Um, but the only ones that really um, took to it were the intellectuals of, of the Northern elite because um, the Southern planters rejected the idea and banned the society from even forming in the South. And most black people were not interested in going back to Africa at that point. 
and felt that the, um, especially the free black people at that time, felt that America was as much as their country as anyone else is in, that they should have a stake in building it and prospering off of it. So, um, and they also seen that it was a hidden agenda because um, one thing that the American colonization society seen as seeing the Africans over uh, the free Africans back overseas is that it would make the slaves or the hostages that were being held, their value would rise because of the scarcity of it. So in New Haven, um, Bacon along with fellow Yale alumni and abolitionist Simeon Jocelyn, they partnered with uh, black leadership in New Haven, like William Lindsay, Bias Stanley, Scipio Augustus, and Prince Duplex to form the African United Ecclesiastical Society and uh, an African Improvement Society. So these, size, these societies were created in cities in the Northeast to provide a basic free education for free blacks to instill useful virtues such as piety, frugality, and work ethic. So in collaboration with the black community and with white sympathizers, uh, New Haven's Improvement Society organized schools, uh, libraries, savings banks, and the creation of New Haven's first black church, which was the Temple Street Church. Uh, and it was led by Simeon Jocelyn and the church now exists on Dixville Avenue as the Dixville Congregational Church. And that's like one of the, one of the oldest black churches in the country. So the white savior mentality of the American Colonization Society clashed with the abolitionists. The white elite wanted to dictate what's best for the black community regardless of the black community's own aspirations. This will create a conflict and the only reason why they were funding education for blacks was not so they can participate in the American society, but to be removed from the America and serve as their proxies in Africa promoting their agenda. So the black community with leadership um, inspired by the lofty words of Jacob Olson and New Haven rejected the American Colonization Society and they created their own agenda. Uh, so around that time, free Africans uh, in the colonies created a newspaper in 1827 called the Freedmen's Journal. And it was used to circulate the ideas and agendas of different free African communities around the, um, mostly from the North, because that's where most of the communities were placed at. And the black community took full advantage of all the educational opportunities and they doubled the population in the schools and learning centers. Um, establishing schools of higher learning became a priority and the American colonization had a similar goal, but they just had an ulterior motive. Higher education in Connecticut um, was very important, and to this day, New Haven is a college town with five colleges and universities in the immediate vicinity. And by 1830, 1% of males in New England were um, college educated, and Connecticut had the highest college matriculation rate in the country per capita. The ideas of the freedmen in New Haven aligned with the rest of the population in the country. They wanted to create a college and trade school to train free hostages so they could be positive contributions to society like William Lansing. Simeon Jocelyn, who represented the interests of the New Haven Black community and a freedman from New York named Peter Williams consolidated their plans of creating a school to present the idea of a Negro college to the second Negro convention that was held in Philadelphia. So the plan presented by Williams and Jocelyn was to create a college for freed hostages so they can have the same advantages that higher learning provides for the white Americans at that time. Williams was initially opposed to any white assistance in the endeavor, but Jocelyn's track record with the New Haven Black community eased his suspicions. And at the time, there were very few colleges admitting Black students. These restrictions created the need for a college to be created that would have connected agriculture horticulture, mechanical arts, as well as studies of the science and the humanities. Um, a wealthy New Haven merchant uh, and philanthropist named Arthur Tappan, who also sponsored the tuition of over 100 Yale students, was a founding member and was also a founding member of the African Educa Education Society. Um, 
was also on board for the college. He was um, also, he was once a follower of the American Colonization Society, but his views eventually evolved to favor um, outright abolition. And he donated land, buildings, and $1,000 to the endeavor. And New Haven was seen as the perfect location for this uh, Negro College. Um, it was close to New York and Boston, and it had a large port, thanks to William Lansing, which made it transportation from the West Indies and from the South feasible, and it was already an intellectual hub. And c compared to New York and Boston, the city didn't have as much racial tension. So the college would produce uh, an intellectual and industrial class of African Americans that will be perpetuated throughout the communities, creating wealth and wealth building opportunities and participating in the big industry that was blowing up in America at that time. The black community had no interest in doing that in Africa. They felt the ownership of America and were entitled to all the amenities that it, um, that it had it provided. And this was contrary to the American Colonization Society and people like Leonard Bacon became upset when known abolitionists started to promote the project also. So Peter Williams and Simeon Jocelyn, they presented their plan to the college of the college uh, to the Negro Convention in Philadelphia at the end of 1831. So let me just explain what the Negro Convention is. The Negro Convention uh, started in 1830 in Philadelphia, which had one of the largest communities of free African Americans at the time. They launched the nation, um, the National Negro Convention to address the hostility, exclusion, discrimination, and violence against African Americans by whites in Northern cities. So the Connecticut delegate to the first um, convention was New Haven business owner, Scipio Augustus. So the next one, um, the convention, when that was uh, the second convention that Williams and Jocelyn went to present, uh, they gave it an enthusiastic approval of the college and prominent abolitionists, William Lloyd Garrison and Benjamin Lundy, um, those people that um, promoted universal emancipation, they began to aid in the fundraising of the college. So after attending the college, um, the convention, I'm sorry, in Philadelphia, Jocelyn was ready to present his plan to the New Haven's Board of Aldermen so they can approve the land sale and the establishment of the school. And the date was set for the first week in September in 1831. So while the free African Americans in the North were exercising their freedoms, uh, the majority of African Americans were still being held hostage and were experiencing the worst atrocities that you can imagine. Torture and violence was part of the daily life in the South. And the human traffickers tried their hardest to prevent the hostages to escape or to even be under the impression of equality. So the few that had escaped to the North were traumatized and dehumanized and the free blacks in the North wanted to end this practice and repair the damage that was done. And education was seen as the way to do that. But the conditions being faced by the African-American hostages in the South needed immediate intervention. And the only use for education in the South for um, the African hostages was to teach other hostages how to read the Bible so they can minister over the, the rest of the black population. They did not promote independence of self or self-determination. They just wanted indoctrination. So while black clergy in the North like Peter Williams were planning a college with white clergymen, a reverend from Southampton County in Virginia felt divinely inspired to take another route in order to liberate African-American hostages. And the name of that reverend was Nat Turner. Born during the era of the Haitian Revolution, even as a young child, he was seen as insightful and was chosen by uh, the human trafficker that held him hostage for religious instruction that taught him how to read and write. He displayed religious devotion and piety and was trusted by both human traffickers and hostages alike. He worked on several plantations, escaping from only one, escaped from one only to return just a month later. And the reason he returned, he had just, uh, cited a biblical passage that stated, return to the service of my earthly master, for he who knows his master's will and doeth it not shall be beaten with many stripes, and thus have I chastened you. 
So Nat Turner, he uh, lost the respect of the African American hostages who felt that his devotion to that slave religion was detrimental to the community. He was sold to other plantations where he finally became into his own. He began to have religious visions that were inspiring him to liberate his people. And in February of 1831, after experiencing a solar eclipse, Nat Turner saw that there was a sign to go forward with his plans. So um, it was originally scheduled for the 4th of July, but um, it ended up being moved over to August 21st, 1831. And that was when Nat Turner with his co-conspirators uh, galvanized an army of at least 70 rebels, armed with axes, mallets, and muskets with the mentality to get free or die trying. <clears throat> The government militia was called in with three extra units of artillery to squash the rebellion. The aftermath left about 60 white victims dead and 53 rebels were later executed by the court, but also countless innocent black people were slaughtered by the militia and white citizens in the South in retaliation for that event. So news of the rebellion reached, the New, uh, reached New Haven and the news reports of the rebellion was right next to an ad uh, giving New Haven residents notice of the Negro College plan for the city. The white residents interpreted that as their town will be the next scene of a rebellion. And at the town meeting, City Hall was packed with angry New Haven residents, as well as Yale students and staff, um, staff and faculty that wanted to show their disapproval of the plan to create an educational hub for Africans in America. The, the city wrote this um, proclamation um, in response. Resolved by the mayor, alderman, common council, and freemen of the city of New Haven in a city meeting assembled that we will resist the establishment of the proposed college in this place by every lawful means. And un, un, not stated was by every unlawful means also. The disapproval became violent and after voting down the plan for the black college, the white town and gown combined to wreak havoc on the black community and whites they suspected of being in favor of abolition. While, uh, with Nat Turner still a fugitive of the law at the time, the law, the level of fear that was reaching became an apex. They went to William Lance's neighborhood, New Liberia, and set fire to homes and beat up black and white residents they found on the street. They went to Arthur Tappan's residence and broke windows and stoned the residence, causing considerable damage. They went to Spireworth in the Hill, which was an integrated neighborhood founded by Simeon Jocelyn and William Lansing, and tore down a house that was owned and housed black families. So the violence uh, went unreported in the newspaper because they were complacent with the violence. And a week before Nat Turner was captured, a newspaper in Vermont released a statement in regards to the climate in New Haven. Uh, it stated that the Northern Blacks must be, uh, um, sarcastically it says, the Northern Blacks must be bound to silence because slavery does not exist in Connecticut. Therefore, within the boundaries of Connecticut, it must not be spoken against because neither Connecticut nor Congress has any control over the laws of South Carolina. Therefore, the free people of color at the North must be doomed to perpetual ignorance and degradation. Such is the logic by which founding of colleges for educating colored people is made out to be an interference with the internal concerns of other states. So the, the, the Southern states in their planter aristocracy um, didn't like those aspects because they knew that the more uh, educated that the population became, uh, their institution had a more um, chance of being destroyed in some way. So um, the violence and backlash continued uh, for years after the, 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 um, the death of Matt Turner in the meeting for the Black College. And uh, William Lansing and Simeon Jocelyn, they bore uh, the brunt of it. Simeon Jocelyn was removed as the leader of the Black Church in 1834 and the Spireworth community he and Lansing founded together was attacked again in 1937. Jocelyn and Williams had to retreat to, from the spotlight and became instrumental in the Underground Railroad. Williams um, 
continued to be persecuted in the city until he died poor, but Jocelyn uh, would later become instrumental in securing freedom for the hostages aboard the Amistad. And um, so this event, um, Connecticut was like a trendsetter. So um, it was the first to forbid blacks to be um, scholars. And he made a law that um, it was illegal to teach free blacks from a different state. And when Prudence Crandall, with assistance from Simeon Jocelyn, opened a school for African descendants, it was reached with the same violent backlash with armed white mobs attacking the school and its residents. And the Yale elite also had the influence to have other northern states to create laws restricting the education of free blacks. They even made a concerted effort to prevent the Negro Convention from attempting to set up another college or school. Um, the Yale um, permitted black people to order classes, but they wouldn't let them enroll officially until after slavery was officially abolished in Connecticut in 1848. And that would be Dr. Cortland Van Rensselaer Creed, who became the first African-American to receive a degree from Yale and the first medical doctor to graduate as well. Uh, this came about, in my opinion, because of his parents' close proximity to Yale alumni and the members of the American Colonization Society. So he was a, a descendant of Prince Duplex, um, who was one of the ones that created the African Improvement Society. His um, mother was one of the first school teachers in the city, and they had a close relationship with Leonard Bacon, who was um, a prominent member of the American Colonization Society in New Haven. And um, Cortland Van Rensselaer um, was an alumni from Yale that was very close with his father, who was um, worked as um, in one of the uh, um, one of the halls that Cortland Van Rensselaer was a part of. So um, this narrative of dangerous educated black men only validated American Colonization Society. The biggest fear of having an educated black population is a fear of revolt and uprising. But my question is, if you are afraid of that happening, why would you continue to oppress them? So the first college to open up for blacks was established in 19, I mean, 1853 as the Ashman Institute, named after Jehudi Ashman, and then later renamed the Lincoln University after Abraham Lincoln, who was also a former member of the American Colonization Society. It is the oldest HBCU, which is a historical black college, and also the school that John Huggins met Erica, which is also a part of New Haven history. So that concludes my report on the history of education and the black population in New Haven. We see the effects of these past decisions in our city today. Um, the white elites would have rather us in these conditions than in a position for us to prosper. And um, the reason this information is being presented is because history has consequences. And the only ones that have, um, well, the ones that have bore the, the more brunt and the negative experiences of these consequences have been the black community, um, especially the youth. And as we observe the present conditions of the black community, much of these, um, much of those being experienced by the community in New Haven and across the country had its roots in the human trafficking economy and um, its attempts to maintain the caste system in its aftermath. So um, the hostages uh, from the South had to adapt to an honor code of violence that was inflict um, inflicted upon them by immigrants from the Scotch Irish Highlands. And the trauma that was experienced by these victims of human trafficking um, and the descendants uh, became generational to the extent that their DNA was altered and the trauma becomes hereditary and easily triggered by the socially oppressive environments that they continue to live in. So the trauma shows up in behavior that are considered risk factors for violence and like violence that we see in our community. So um, they come in three different levels, the individual level, relational level, and environmental level. So that trauma on an individual level um, starts within the household. So if a child um, has um, aggression and maltreatment at a young age, that is a predictor that um, as they grow older, they'll be um, aggressive and violent. And within that neighborhood, you know, 
that violence will be perpetuated. And um, on a relational level, the, the trauma shows up um, as behavior for like a problematic family as far as uh, communication, uh, family dysfunction, low emotional attachments to parents and caregivers, and um, exposure to violence that is present within the environment. And like I said, uh, um, a lot of these uh, behaviors have been adopted basically um, from their time as um, hostages in a violent environment. And none of these things have been corrected. So it's just being perpetuated through generations. And then the environmental factors um, are where the society comes in because um, we have high concentration of poverty, um, transiency, which means like there's like a home ownership within the community, uh, low community civic participation. So um, they're not dealing with politics, so they're not really involved with uh, getting the things that they need because basically from like a knowledge and knowing how to and also from just being discouraged based off the, you know, years of being disenfranchised. Um, low social capital, that basically comes from access to ideas and limited income opportunities. And all those come together to create an environment where violence is perpetuated. And that has an effect on like the education. So in New Haven, um, there's an educational gap. And as I laid out in the previous segment, um, providing a quality education for black youth was seen as destabilizing. And the achievement gap in New Haven is still problematic. Connecticut has the largest achievement gap in the country and the underfunding of education and lack of opportunities for black children has been used as a tool to criminalize the population. And uh, Yale's role in this environment, um, they play a part in, in creating it because the university, just one aspect of it is that the university just pays pennies on the dollars in its taxes for its $2.5 billion real estate portfolio. And this money that could be used towards the public schools to provide um, a more quality education where they're able to address the trauma that many of the students um, have experienced and um, are currently enduring. So that creates um, a wealth gap. And let me put up my two slides that I want to just illustrate for everybody right now. So this is the Opportunity Atlas. So the Opportunity Atlas is something that was created by um, a Harvard graduate named Raj Chetty, and it gives up um, all the census data over um, like a longitudinal study, and it anonymized uh, census data so you can get a snapshot and predict um, the uh, income um, capabilities, um, incarceration rates for people growing up in certain census tract in neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods that I chose to look at is um, the Dixville neighborhood and Prospect Hill neighborhood. So these are the two. Um, one's a historical black neighborhood and one has been historical white and they both neighbor um, Yale University. So a young black male growing up in the Dixville neighborhood, his um, household income potential would be 17,000 and his incarceration rate would be 21%. So when you go over, you go over the hill to Prospect Hill, and if you were born as a, a white male, your potential income would be 76,000 and your incarceration rate would be less than 1%. So that right there tells you the, the effects of how um, this history has played out over the centuries and that, you know, still feel the effects to this day because, you know, comparing the lives of these young men growing up in the neighborhood, um, the white young white man will make four times as much um, as the annual income as a black male and the black male is 20 times more likely to be incarcerated. So like I said, like that has been going on since the beginning and the, the beginning of the colony and still perpetuated to this day. So um, I call that a tale of two cities. 
And that concludes um, that part of my presentation. And now we're open for questioning now. Okay, so I'll go to the queue and read off the oh. questions to you. Okay. Um, so we get, so we have a question. We have five questions in the in the, uh, Q and A right now. So the first one is from uh, Josie Stewart Engel, and it says, "I notice you say human trafficker rather than more traditional coloners uh, terminology, slave trader. Um, I've never heard that done before, and it strikes me as a really good and important difference in messaging." Could you talk about how, when, and why you made the decision to switch up your language? Well, um, cause right now it seems like um, slave trader it, it, it gets uh, brushed off and it doesn't really have a real impact in um, especially in current day and in, in current society. We hear slave trader people think about biblical times and you don't really think about modern times. So um, a real modern day term that people um, that strikes concern with people with human trafficking because you see um those type of things being done today but it's the same it's the same continuation and that um it it, it brings along when you hear that so it, it, there is no difference than what was going on and people was being taken but without their will and, and and being sold as property so that is the reason why um i chose that and i've i've been doing that part for about a year Cause just really just looking at it and just having different discussions with people in regards to um, in regards to history, and they, they always want to do like, okay, well, Africans did the same thing, but it, it, everyone had a different practice. But the practice of capitalism in America with um, moving human bodies would be more um, to human trafficking than to just people being captured through war. Okay, good answer. Um. The next question is from Jennifer uh, to give me, and I apologize if Jennifer, I, I, well, I apologize. No, no, if I definitely mispronounce your uh, last name. Um, it says, I appreciate that you challenge common understanding of crime by showing all the unrecognized crime committed by Yale past and present. How do you think the current Yale students can use this to effectively dismantle Yale police department? Well, it's also just well, just looking at the history of it. You know, what is the purpose of Yale Police Department? You know, I've been harassed by Yale the Police Department many times, just for me being in proximity to the school and not looking like I belong. And you know, and like like there's been a big incident with um, a few years back on the campus with Charles Blow's son, and since then there's been many incidents within there that don't get reported out. So um, it's really just good to just have a uh, you need to have like an open dialogue and really discuss like what is the whole purpose of, you know, because they criminalize people. So it, it, they, that's why this information is, I presented it because this is part of a, it's not a, a snapshot of just now, it's part of a historical trend that has always been inside this city. So that intimidation level um, is just beefed up with your police department, you know, and you know, they, was involved with the shooting of a New Haven resident, you know, not too far back. So there is a, um, a discussion that needs to be held in regards to Yale Police Department. Um, and I'm sure that the uh, students would uh, more than love to have that discussion uh, and definitely talk to you um, around, around those issues. Um, there's so much more to your story, um, um, and we're, we're so short on time. Um, 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 it's so funny. I'm afraid these last questions, but um, I actually, uh, I'm thinking maybe we should just do a part two um, within this this cycle because I have an iffy workshop person. So if they want to be iffy, I, I would love to uh, continue this discuss this 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 incredible historical account um, and tying it to so many modern narratives, which was really to the point of the. Uh, Civic allyship was like, you know, uh, uh, Yale students, they get a very, an eagle eye. You know, they're, they're getting a trained eagle eye on things. And I, but I think an appropriate eagle's eye is being able to also get down to the issue and see it on the ground and see how it's played out. And you, you've tied that together uh, wonderfully through history. Um, so um, uh, Mona Chalabi asked, could you say a little more about the white association that was advocating for the abolition, the abolishment of slavery but also vehemently against integration. 
When did they stop their work? Did they morph into something else? P.S. Thank you so much. This has been really informative. We'll definitely listen to the podcast. Um, yeah, the American Colonization Society. So, um, it was, uh, it, it's like they piggybacked off of, um, uh, a, a social movement that was a grassroots social movement that black people in America had, and they just used it for their, um, for their benefit. So, um, and like I said, like, it integrated into being like the people that started a lot of the early institutions for black intellectuals was started by the American Colonization Society, but they wanted to be the ones that controlled who and how they were educated. So that was the reason why they had such a problem with the, um, the New Haven School was because the people that were in, in charge of the education in the curriculum were going to be more empowering for the community and independence than for um, people to be more like, um, and I don't really want to say this in a negative light, but to be like more like Booker T. Washington, who wanted to like accept a secondary role within American society and just um, work for more um, affluent white people. So that was the, um, that was the main goal of American colonization society, especially after the end of the Civil War, where it was just, you know, they had to deal with the problem for his hand. And um, I'm doing more research on that, and it has a very, very interesting um, twist and turns in it. So um, definitely, we all, 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 I would love to just have uh, discussions on that, you know, just uh, if you could take my contact information, um, I would love to just, you know, have a discourse with you about that. Okay, and so yeah, we'll definitely make sure that um, those who want to get in touch with you will have all access to that. Um, Amon Girodi asked, um, you mentioned many names of human traffickers which are familiar to Yale students as the names of our residential colleges, Davenport, Stiles, and Berkeley, among many others, not to mention the name Yale itself. It has not adequately addressed this history, nor has it renamed any of these colleges. What are your thoughts on how Yale could could and should move forward in terms of reckoning with this history? In addition into in addition to renaming these colleges, what are other actions you think the university and its students could take to make their commitment to anti-racism concrete and not just performative? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Um, you know, like my purpose is not to have like part of like the cancel culture or anything like that. You know, um, this information is history. You know, this is what it is, and it's not uh, without sugarcoating it. So, um, like, if if the the power, well, if the people that that have that type of authority at Yale um, feel that there's no there's no reason to do so or to change it, you know, that that shows a lot of what they value and how they see um, being respectful towards all people, and. Um, even just educating people on what it was, even like, you know, giving people an understanding of why it is to be and do they still respect that? So you can't really hold a human trafficker in a, a positive light. And that's kind of hard to do so, even like the ill-gotten gains off of that. So it, they do have a lot of explaining to do. And like, that's why I'm presenting this information out there because this information is available. All these are like, they got primary records and some people have been sourcing this for years. And um, and it seems like it has to be something real drastic for them to address it. Because um, I remember when Calhoun College was still up and they had the, um, one of the friends from my neighborhood had to break one of the windows in order for them to really start taking it seriously that they got to rename this place and, and not have that window up. But it's been, you know, decades of black students and black workers having to be around that environment, which is hostile. It's real hostile. But, you know, they don't take that into consideration when we're dealing with, you know, the black population or people that would see that as being negative. And that just, you know what I'm saying, is a testament to the callousness and like how they disregard the black population in New Haven. Like, and that's what this presentation just shows like the historical um, aspect of them doing that. They, they've been doing that for years. 
Um, thank you for that. Um, well articulated answer. Um, and as a, a like a native even, I, uh, from a New Haven perspective, uh, uh, not really um, knowing how to approach that, like, cause you know the history, but what do you do with that when you have an institution? So that's why, like, I, I love this this, this platform, um, and I hope it grows. That um, we're able to have these discussions and, and able to give these historical perspectives to students who, to me, the immediate the immediate equitable part that that that, that can that can that can start to happen is changing and influencing those who are coming out of the institution um because then you know the, the equity can come out of them then coming back and seeing uh the need to be active in in in, in the affairs of new Haven and beyond the four years in the school um and our final question is from melissa wang and she says uh how do you see academic institutions yale specifically in influence to quell uprising and revolt in current times, whether through soft or hard power? Um, well, like, it's, it's really just, because, like, Yale is, like I said, it's an intellectual hub, you know, and, like, a lot of information now I, I, that I'm using, I'm getting it from, you know, sources from Yale or different um, studies that came out of Yale. So um, it's really just making information accessible and, like, Dialogues like these need to be more commonplace. So it, it shouldn't be like some like, you know, 50 people get to hear this type of conversation. It's be, it should be a conversation being done as part of their like, freshman orientation. And this conversation to be perpetuated throughout each year and as they grow, how they see the world. So that um, once you get to that, uh, once you graduate, you'll see exactly how everything is holistic, you know? So one thing doesn't happen without another. So like I said, um, in, in some parts of the, the way the city works that, you know, it, it benefits off of an uneducated population because they need people to do a lot of the menial work within the campus. So that's why the, the school not contributing to the educational fund of the city is a benefit for the university and a detriment to the community surrounding it. So um, it's like a, a lot of things you got to really just just coming to grips and, and seeing the reality and seeing exactly like how do we um how do we create equity, you know? Mm -hmm. And a lot a lot of it starts with you know you got it's, it's money involved because like I said it's a it's a it's an in, in equal distribution of wealth that's been perpetuated throughout these centuries. And like I showed you with that um the opportunity at, at, um, atlas that you know this one kid is going to make four times just because of the street that he grew up on. And, the, and what he has access to. And, you know, just by, you know, it, it, this is a, a real, real tricky thing just to see a, how to get to from point A to point B. But the, the first thing needs to be that information needs to be out and people need to be able to have this dialogue. So, you know, yeah. that's, that's one thing that they definitely can do so that, you know, people saying that systemic racism and oppression is like a fallacy or like a, um, some pop culture the catchphrase and stuff like that, you know, when it's really hard numbers and experiences that can show and prove that it is a, a real thing that definitely has its, its place in a discussion on how to get um, America to where it's, it says it, it wants to be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, one of the key points before, before we wrap up, I just want to say, um, you know, Yale gives money, uh, but I think, and I think we overlook the fact that though it gives money uh, to educational purposes, if you look at the amount it saves in tax purposes, uh, in taxes, it's a, uh, it's not money. It's not money at all, right? Exactly. Um, but um, we're we're gonna uh, in respect of time, we're gonna um, end here. I want to thank you. Um, I want you to come back um, during this uh, cycle. One because. What many of you don't know is not their story, and there's another. There's more to his his work that I would love for him to get through, but I also love to then incorporate what, how he came to this work. Um, if you were able to read his bio, you see some of it, but to actually hear him speak to the story, um, we could talk about some real New Haven connections through through that um, within the coming weeks. Um, um, so from there, I'm gonna let uh, everyone go. I actually, please, you get the chance to fill out the survey. Please do so. Um, 
uh, this will be, this is recorded and will be up and all contact information for an idea will be given. Um, we thank you. Um, we thank you guys for, 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 uh, being here and, 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 and giving your time to hear this. Nadia, I thank you so much for coming out, bro, and just um mm-hmm. just giving so much of yourself to us today. And um we look forward to hearing from you again. No problem. Thanks for the opportunity. Like I said, this is a um it's a discussion that I, I love having. So like I said, if you have anything that you want to just uh send to me or anybody in the audience that's listening, if you got any questions or ideas that you just want to throw my way, like I'm I'm open. Like this is the purpose of while I'm doing what I'm doing is to create this type of bridge so that we can start having these discussions. So um, I'm open to anything, um, any assistance. Uh, definitely check out my uh, podcast, Young Adults Learning the Evil. Just type it into Google and everything will come out. And, um, you know, uh, I appreciate this opportunity and look forward to, to definitely meeting with anyone in the future. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you, everyone, to our cohort. Um... We'll be Joe will be in touch about when we're meeting. We're we'll meeting in the in uh, the next couple, next few days. Um, our cohort is still open. We figure we can invite more people in. So if you have friends, uh, let them know that this is still available. Um, we want to uh, do next next steps as many as possible. Um, that will give you a uh, different uh, access to Nadir, um, which I'm sure he'll be looking forward to. So, um, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend and be safe.